Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is Sean Sloan. I'm the Senior Transportation Policy Analyst here at the Council of State Governments. I want to thank uh, you all for joining us for this portion of the Growth and Prosperity Virtual Summit of the States. Over the next 90 minutes or so, we're going to talk transportation, uh, specifically efforts to reauthorize federal transportation programs and provide funding for them. Most importantly, we're also going to get into what various competing visions for the future of transportation could mean for state governments and for America's future growth and prosperity, in keeping with the overarching theme of this webinar series. Before we get started, I wanted to put in a plug for the CSG Knowledge Center. This session is, as we say here, powered by the Knowledge Center, which is the place on the CSG website where we gather all of our policy work. It's a one-stop shop for policy briefs, articles, blog posts, suggested state legislation, resolutions, meeting summaries, and more on all of the uh, policy areas CSG covers. You can access the Knowledge Center by going online to www.csg.org and clicking on Knowledge Center. To access all of our transportation-related policy work, you can find it at www.csg.org slash transportation. Uh, it's there that I blog frequently on topics like reauthorization and what states are doing in transportation funding. You'll also find recent uh, CSG briefs on uh, things like tolling and congestion pricing, uh, VMT fees, public-private partnerships, and any number of other issues you may hear about during today's webinar. Uh, the Knowledge Center is also where you will find an archived version of today's presentations in the days ahead as well as uh, follow-up articles on the issues discussed today. So I encourage you to check it out, bookmark it, subscribe to the RSS feed if you like. You can also follow us on Twitter, at uh, CSG Transport is my handle on there. Uh, that's always a good way to find out when we're releasing something new that's transportation related. Uh, we've assembled a, a great panel today to try to, to make sense of what may lie ahead for transportation reauthorization. I do want to announce at the outset that, unfortunately, Jack Basso of AASHTO has had to send his regrets. Uh, the principals from AASHTO are all involved in a reauthorization steering committee meeting going on today in Baltimore, so Mr. Basso is unable to join us. Fortunately, we do have with us Ron Ut from the Heritage Foundation and Donna Cooper of the Center for American Progress. These folks are going to take us sort of behind the scenes of what's happening in Washington right now and what the policy debates are going to be like going forward. Um, their combined experience represents many years of work on federal and state transportation policy issues. Uh, those of you who have registered for the webinar today will also have a unique opportunity to ask these very knowledgeable folks a question. Uh, following their presentation, we'll have uh, them field as many questions as we have time for. Um, and since we have uh, so many folks joining us on the webinar today, the way we'll handle Q&A is you can type in a question uh, right on the uh, GoToWebinar interface at, at any time. Um, there is a, there's a box uh, down below that says questions, which you can expand and, and you can enter your question there. Uh, my colleague, uh, Crady Degolian, is here to uh, collect those and, and pass them along to me. And I'll try to ask as, as many of uh, the questions of our panelists uh, following their presentation. Uh, if you're, uh, if you're having a technical issue or want to ask the CSG staff here a question, you can also ask us in the chat window, which is below the, the questions panel there. So without uh, further ado, I want to introduce our first speaker. Uh, Ronald Utt is the Herbert and Joyce Morgan Senior Research Fellow for the Thomas A. Rowe Institute for Economic Policy Studies at the Heritage Foundation. At Heritage, uh, Dr. Ut conducts research on housing, transportation, and the federal budget. He also specializes in the application of privatization, restructuring, decentralization, and devolution of government programs, and works in cooperation with scholars across the United States to evaluate the success and failure of policies for urban revitalization, land use, and growth management. In the 1970s, he served in positions at the Department of Housing and Urban Development, the Office of Management and Budget, and the National Association of Real Estate Investment Trusts. From 1980 to 87, he served as Associate Chief Economist at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. In 1987, uh, President Reagan appointed Dr. Ott to lead his administration's efforts to promote the transfer of some federal government functions to the private sector. From 1989 to 1990, Dr. Ott served as Heritage's 
senior fellow in political economy before being named executive vice president of the National Chamber Foundation, which is the research and education division of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. Dr. Ut, thank you for being with us, and the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Sean, for having me, and uh, I look forward to participating today. Um, so if you want to pop up my, uh, I guess, my first slide, we can uh, begin the presentation today. Great. There we go. Okay. Uh, the, uh, the trust fund uh, debate uh, he, today and in the past has really always been about money. Uh, and it's always taken a long time to do. Uh, the, the 2005 uh, reauthorization, Safety Lou, uh, was actually 20 months late, uh, despite the fact that the president was a Republican and the House and Senate were in Republican control, so there were no big ideological differences or, or political posturing to deal with. But the issue back then was money. Uh, Congress wanted to spend about $100 billion more than the president did over the next five years and they wanted to raise the gas tax, the president didn't, and in the end, the president won. <laughs> Safety Lou expired in, in, uh, in, in September 2009, and so we're now 18 months uh, into, the, uh, into the process of, of attempting to reauthorize authorize the program, and really no closer today than we, than we were uh, 18 months ago. Uh, the big problem uh, confronting the, the money problem confronting the Highway Trust Fund is actually <laughs> much worse than it was uh, six or seven years ago, and that is that the trust fund is no longer self-sufficient. Uh, for example, in 2009, it received uh, almost uh, about $31 billion in gas tax revenues and, and other user fees, uh, and allocated uh, and obligated about $42 billion. So the gap there is, is about $11 billion. It's been in deficit since 2008, <laughs> and the near near term future, unless spending is either constrained or taxes increase, will will be more of the same. The gap's been covered by general revenues, and with growing concern about the size of the deficit, which is now about 1.6 trillion dollars a year, um, <laughs> they're looking for places. Congress is looking for places to cut. And so is the president, and uh, and and the question is, how much longer can can the, the the ordinary taxpayer be expected to bail out the trust fund without any other changes. At the same time, both Congress and uh, and the White House uh, have have declared their, uh, in one way or the other, their opposition to any increase in the, in the federal fuel tax, and have also, uh, or at least uh, the White House has opposed a uh, a, a VMT tax, which. Uh, which uh, many many people are considering. <laughs> so the situation in Washington for for re reauthorization is is grim and, and frankly getting getting grimmer. Uh, next slide, please. As I said, we're about 18 months overdue. Uh, the uh, we've extended it till September September 2001. <laughs> uh, yet at least as of a month ago, White House and Congress were very far apart on their proposals, which I will discuss in a, in a little bit of little slightly more detail uh, in the next couple of slides. But I think the real problem uh, confronting uh, the reauthorization process is just how crowded the calendar is uh, for major legislative initiatives or, or major controversial and complicated legislative initiatives. Uh, if, you've been, <laughs> if you've been reading the newspapers or watching TV or listening to the radio news over the last couple of weeks, you know that the, uh, the Congress and the House and the Senate and the, and the White House have been locked in, an, in a fairly uh, uh, aggressive and complicated uh, and time-consuming debate over the last six months of the current budget. Um, now, once they finish that, they've got a, they've got two big challenges. One is the debt ceiling, which will probably be equally divisive, and more divisive than the current uh, <laughs> the two, finishing up the 2001 budget is doing the 2012 budget, uh, where the new Congress will likely uh, use this as an opportunity to put forth a budget that is reflective of of, of, of significantly changed approaches to existing federal programs, <laughs> and where the president will do the same. So I suspect that if you thought the, 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 the debate over 2011 was divisive, that the, the debate over 2012 is going to be even more divisive, and the current budget uh, will expire at the same time that the current reauthorization does. 
So uh, as my guess uh, is that there won't be enough room uh, or time to seriously think through uh, a reauthorization program uh, renew reauthorization, and as a consequence, it will be extended once again into into the distant future, which means that the delay will be even greater than the 20 months uh, in the past. Um, if we could uh, flick to the next uh, uh, slide, <laughs> and the issues besides money uh, that, that that you know captivate the press and, and transportation professionals is the ongoing problem with the security of our bridges, uh, deteriorating roads. Uh, safety is always an issue, but as you know, uh, the safety results for the, for the past year were almost record-breaking, and so that's not in everybody's mind. Uh, but for the average person, <laughs> what is of concern is commute times and congestion, which in major metropolitan areas are fairly significant, fairly severe, and, and often getting worse. Uh, next slide. Now, the, the two contending plans right now, because the Senate really hasn't come up with its own plan, is the House Republican plan, which is really only a few select talking points. Uh, and, and one of the key principles there is that they're going to, uh, whatever they do, they're going to limit highway spending to, to trust fund revenues. Now, as I pointed out in, in, in the first slide, the, there's a big gap between trust fund revenues and current trust fund spending, which means that if they do that, the current reauthor the next reauthorization will likely involve uh, significantly less annual uh, spending on federal transportation programs. Uh, in addition, uh, they've committed themselves, uh, as the president has done, to, to no fuel tax increase. And uh, to the extent that they've thought about other sources of, uh, uh, of, of revenues, they're encouraging uh, public-private partnerships, uh, which I'm in favor of, but I view public-private partnerships as a tool and, and not a panacea. Uh, next slide. <coughs> The president has come out with a fairly detailed plan as part of his budget about five weeks ago. Uh, there's a 42-page uh, transportation budget, which is probably available online from the US DOT if you haven't already seen it. And, and some of the highlights of that is that you know, the budget that he proposed uh, would be, um, uh, would at least next year, increase uh, tra surface and, and, and uh, transportation spending. Uh, by 89 percent, uh, a huge jump, uh, which uh, it, it was argued we, we need to quickly make up uh, for for the for the deterioration in the roads. We also want to help jumpstart the economy with a big boost in spending. Uh, the whole uh, reauthorization program would be about 500 billion over six years. That compares with about 285 billion for the past reauthorization bill. Uh, added to the, uh, the program are uh, included in the program are essentially three new programs uh, that will total about 130 billion dollars over the over the six years. It's a livability program, uh, a, a, an infrastructure bank, um, and w would include for the first time in the highway trust fund uh, passenger rail, high speed rail, and, uh, and other rail programs at a significant increase in spending in comparison to the past. Uh, many of these new programs move from kind of the you know, reliance on, on states spending the money subject to an allocation formula and, and some guidelines to, to more of a competitive grant program where the money will be, will be there and states will then, then submit uh, uh, proposals for getting it, and, and there will be winners and losers, and, and the winners will move away with uh, with the money, uh, much the way the uh, a, uh, the the Recovery Act uh, high speed rail program worked. Uh, <laughs> how it will be funded, the president hasn't said, uh, and he has suggested in the in, in the proposal that there will be. Uh, a bipartisan tax plan that everybody will sort of come together and once they agree on, on, on how much to spend and what to spend it on, then we'll figure out how, how to get the revenues. Uh, next slide, please. <laughs> okay, now um, there are a number of, of ongoing issues that of concern with the Federal Highway 
program that, that I have and, and a number of other people have and certainly a number of states have uh, that uh, aren't, aren't really being addressed in any of the proposals, however specific or, or however vague they are. Uh, neither the, neither the, the congressional proposal or the administration proposal addresses the donor donee equity issues. Um, I, I, every every year I <laughs> calculate the uh, the ratio, and in, in, in twenty eight in two thousand and nine, in, in measuring shares in and shares out, uh, there were twenty eight donor states in the country, and some like 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 Texas and and, and Florida. Uh, we're, we're receiving returns in the mid-80% level. Uh, another problem is that the program uh, has a lack of focus. Uh, once the interstate highway it was created as a federal aid highway program to build the interstate highway system in 1956, that was largely completed in the early 1980s. Uh, since then, it has, has, it has suffered from an from absence of a, of a clear, and clear and defining objective as was well the interstate highway system, so it's sort of drifted around. There's really no rational allocation system for how we pick, pick projects, how we pick modes. Uh, in, increasingly, more and more people have discovered that the Highway Trust Fund is a source of great money, and they've gotten access to it, and this has led to a growing number of what I call uh, diversions from the Trust Fund. Originally, most of the money went to highways. A transit got into it in 1982, and over time, the Appalachian Regional Commission, uh, national parks, wildlife refuges, uh, historic covered bridges, flower gardens, and so on, uh, train station repair, <laughs> have, have been access have been able to to access the Highway Trust Fund. And, and I, every couple of years, do do a paper uh, in terms of discuss showing these diversions, and and and, and my analysis suggests that the motorists and truckers who, who pay uh, essentially 100% of the revenues into the trust fund get back about 65% in terms of, of, of spending on general purpose highways. Uh, next, pro next slide, please. So some of the things that, that I would like to see in the next in, in the uh, next reauthorization bill is one that accelerates a path to greater equity. Uh, as, as some of the listeners know, the, the, there, have been, there are regional patterns to, to donors and donees. Most of the donor states are, are in the southeast and, 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 and the Great Lakes area and New Jersey. Uh, and many of the, uh, the donee states are in, in the northeast and the middle Atlantic states. And, and there are also issues of, 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 besides just sort of financial equity, is sort of issues of income equity and, and growth equity as well. Um, and I would also like to see a uh, focus on, on cost-effective mobility to, to, to make some guidance between uh, you know, how we allocate money by mode. Uh, transit gets about 20 percent, and that's viewed as its historic fair share, and nobody ever questions whether this is the most appropriate way to enhance mobility and transportation in the United States. And, and increasingly, you've had hiking paths and bicycle paths and, and school sidewalks to, to that as well. And so, um, and again, there's, there's really no <laughs> uh, attempt to do any kind of cost-benefit analysis in terms of how we allocate the money between programs, between modes, between regions, and, and other such things. I'd also like to see uh, more opportunities for states to take advantage of tolling opportunities for public-private partnerships and, 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 and greater flexibility in, in how the money is allocated. Uh, one of the problems is we have a, a program that, that is you know, oriented toward a, sort of the average state when the track really isn't any such thing as average state. <laughs> you have states like New York where, where 24 or 42 percent of all transit in America occurs and, and places like Oklahoma where there's hardly any transit at all and where there are differences in, 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 in the age of the highways and in Pennsylvania where there's lots and lots of bridges and so on and so on. <laughs> so we need a program that has more flexibility. Um, uh, next slide, please. Now, what I what I prepared here, and this is from the American Community Survey, which is which is the uh, uh, the uh, a, a, a program of the U.S. Census. They've every every year, uh, for most counties, all states, and the country as a whole, 
they have an, an kind of an employment section, and one of the one of the parts of that, which many of you are probably familiar with, is what historically has been called the journey to work table. And that's how people get to work, how people get along, <laughs> and uh, and we can see from the first two rows that about 86 percent uh, of Americans get to work uh, by driving, either in cars or in van pools. Uh, five percent uh, use public transportation. Actually, it's rounded up to five. It's about 4.9 or so, and uh, and that's down from about eight um, percent um, two decades ago, <laughs> and it's been stabilized at about a five percent level for the, for the last last many years. Uh, 2.9 percent walked. Uh, other includes. Uh, uh, taxis, uh, bicycles, uh, passenger rail. I mean, there are people in Philadelphia who take Amtrak up to their jobs in, in New York City and, and vice versa. And uh, and then finally, uh, the fastest growing share, and uh, which many expect will will overtake transit in, uh, in in about two or three years, is working at home. So these are actually non-commuters, uh, or they. Or they get to work by uh, by walking from their bedroom to their kitchen to their to their home office, and that's the extent of their commute. And that's sort of an interesting area that really hasn't been fully developed because it, it actually takes it requires no public spending whatsoever, uh, alleviates traffic congestion, and uh, and and, uh, and and as as a work at homer. Uh, creates an awful lot more job satisfaction than, than, than those who have to go through torturous commutes every day. Uh, next slide. Now, you know, this is a sort of kind of goes along with uh, <laughs> with the different modal choices that Americans make uh, as registered by by the census, and, and this is how uh, this this is a, an effort to to measure. Uh, the federal transportation subsidy. Now, mind you, this is only the federal transportation subsidy. Uh, federal transportation spending on on surface trans transportation is about one third of all spending. Uh, the bulk of it is by states and, and to a lesser extent, by by local governments. <laughs> so, looking at the federal government and normalizing this on a per one thousand passenger miles or per passenger per thousand miles. Um, we see that, that automobiles actually make a profit. The motorist actually makes a profit for the federal government <laughs> because it's the motorist taxes that are then used to fund transit, bicycle paths, covered bridges, and all the other diversions, so national parks, the Appalachian Regional Commission, the Delta Commission, and, and so on and so on. Uh, buses uh, actually uh, don't pay their, their full way. These are, these are inner city buses. Uh, their, their subsidy is about a dollar fifty. A commercial aviation subsidy per passenger is fairly low, and that's because air, both airlines and passengers combined pay about thirteen different taxes and user fees um, uh, in, into the aviation trust fund, uh, which which mostly essentially like 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 highways at the federal level it's self funded. Uh, general aviation uh, obviously is very controversial and up there. Uh, transit is $165 um, per passenger mile, and passenger railroad, which in this case is almost exclusively Amtrak, uh, is, is the most expensive. All the data from this come from the um, from from the federal government, and we are these are calculations by Heritage Foundation using the same uh, method of calculation that. Department of Transportation used when it last did this in 2004, and uh, and I can direct anybody to kind of a fairly lengthy paper that we did uh, on this. Um, next slide. Okay. Now, as, as I, I discussed, uh, you know some of the <laughs> concerns that, that some have, and, and some of the concerns that I have uh, with the program is that is that you attempt to have one program for for a diverse collection of states and, and regions and geographies, and most people are, are, are you know there is some flexibility in how you spend, but for, but for the most part people are are forced into a, a certain set of uh, goals and objectives that are established in Washington, whether they're they're valuable for a particular state or region or not. Uh, 
is often immaterial. Um, as, as I discussed, diversions and mandates and increasing preference toward micromanaging, that is, instead of simply sending out the money with broad goals, actually picking it in Washington, actual projects to fund and making judgment between those. Uh, the, um, the other one is the transportation of <laughs> some potential solutions. Uh, to this are the, um, and so I would, my solution to that is sort of trying to come up with a cleaner bill which, which gives more discretion and more powers to the states and much more flexibility. Uh, some legislation that would actually do this uh, was introduced in 1997 uh, called the Transportation Empowerment Act, uh, which many of you might know as, as, a ter as, as a colloquially the turn back proposal. Uh, back in 1997, which was, I think, was a high watermark for, for, for support by the states, uh, more than 20 states joined a coalition called Step 21 uh, that, that lobbied aggressively for the enactment of the Transportation Empowerment Act, which back then was introduced by uh, Congressman Kasich, now governor of, of Ohio, and, uh, and then Senator Connie Mack. Uh, next slide. Okay, just a couple of details on the Transportation Empowerment Act. As I said, it was first uh, introduced in 1997, and slightly modified versions of it have been introduced almost in every successive con uh, um, a Congress since then. Uh, at the present time, uh, I, I, I've I've had some discussions with uh, Senator DeMint and South Carolina staff, and they advised me that they are in the process of, of working on a, an updated version of the Transportation Empowerment Act that, that they will uh, be introducing perhaps with, with, within a month. They, they've shared the draft of it with me, and I've given them some comments, and it's my sense that they're going to go forward with, with this. Uh, their, their program, uh, their legislation and, and all the past versions of this basically have a couple things in common. It's about a five-year, sometimes a six-year phase out of the federal highway program, where it's gradually transferred to the states in an incremental basis. And how they do this is that each year, three or four cents uh, of, of the federal gas tax it is it, the gas tax is reduced, and the states have the option of increasing their gas tax by the same same cents per gallon amount so that the, um, uh, the, the the total gas tax paid by the individual consumer doesn't change. Now, and then some of these programs, uh, uh, some of the legislation year to year varies on, on whether the federal government will have some lingering responsibility, uh, typically the interstate highway uh, program and the, uh, and, 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 and safety. Uh, have been viewed as things that should stay with the federal government to oversee uh, on, on part of the states. Uh, next one, please. And finally, a couple of things that I just that, that, are, that I think are notable that I wanted to call your attention to, if you haven't already seen them, are some of the reforms that, that a couple of states have taken uh, in response to their own transportation issues that that are independent of anything that happens in Washington, D.C. Uh, one of the things that I thought was very interesting but also very controversial uh, was a performance audit that was conducted in 2007 uh, by the state auditor in, in Washington State. Uh, Washington State is unique in that their auditor is, is, is independently elected uh, by the population and, and doesn't really answer to either the governor or the legislature. And uh, it, he then looks for policy issues to get involved in. As he talked to people around the state, he found that traffic congestion was, was, a, was kind of everybody's priority, particularly in the Puget Sound area, Seattle and Tacoma. <laughs> and so he then uh, got, got enough money to, to put out for contract a, uh, a what is essentially a performance audit, which, which tried to raise the question of, can we spend our money better? Now we're not talking about reducing overtime or, or getting a good 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 price on rebars, but but how do we pick our projects? And uh, and so the uh, the consulting firm called Delcan uh, uh, got the contract and spent about a half a year there and came up with a uh, a, uh, a fairly extensive array of, of projects and proposals. 
And essentially what they had to do was they had to work within the existing uh, budget projections for transportation. That is, they, they, they couldn't propose any more money. They said, how can we more effectively, the question they were asked was, how can we more effectively spend the money we have? And by, by, by emphasizing congestion mitigation as the goal of project selection, uh, they estimated that over the, over the five-year period, uh, that the uh, congestion in the Puget Sound region could be reduced by 15 to 20 percent. Uh, it was really never enacted. It was not welcomed by the DOT uh, nor the legislature because uh, by establishing a sort of a quantitative uh, measuring cost-benefit system uh, takes a lot of the discretion out of, 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 of institutions that now have a lot of discretion in picking projects and uh, and, uh, and choosing how money is, is spent and, and who gets the bucks. Uh, next slide. Now this is the this is the last one. This is and this is the most recent one. Uh, Governor Bob McDonnell in Virginia uh, ran on a, uh, a, 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 a ran a campaign that relied heavily upon uh, improving transportation in the state. Uh, Virginia uh, is a lot of the, the wealth and population is concentrated in the Washington D.C. area, where where congestion, as as uh, as as as, made, as measured by the uh, uh, Texas Transportation Institute, is is the second or, or third worst in the country, and uh, <laughs> so the governor and the governor also uh, committed himself to no gas tax increase in this, which everybody thought was was crazy, and he was heavily criticized by some of the, the, the local newspapers for making uh, unrealistic uh, proposals. Uh, however, when he got in, uh, the first thing he did well, with his new uh, Secretary of Transportation is to conduct four separate audits. Uh, and these, these audits were different than the, the audit in, in, in the state of Washington. Uh, two were done by uh, four comp, uh, private uh, auditing companies under contract. One was done by a state agency and another one was done by a uh, the federal transportation research entity as well. And, and one of the audits, uh, the, the one that looked into how the money was being spent and where it was coming from, uh, revealed that there were 1.4, uh, almost $1.5 billion of unused or easily verifiable wasted funds uh, in the system, and that uh, two, 214 million of it would, was available immediately, with another uh, 836 available over six years. And so, th so this was then devoted toward funding uh, 900 new projects that had been sitting on the uh, on the on the shelf for a while because of, of a lack of money. So Virginia is moving forward uh, with these funds with a fairly expansive. Um, 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 uh, rebuilding program uh, and, and still no plans for, for a tax increase. Uh, and that concludes my remarks. Uh, thank you for the opportunity and we'll be on later for some questions. Thanks. Dr. Ott, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, again, if you have a question for Dr. Ott or for our next speaker, you may type it into the GoToWebinar interface on your screen at any time in the expandable box marked questions. If you're having any issues, uh, any technical issues with, with uh, uh, typing in a question, you can uh, send us an email here. You can send your question directly to questions at csg.org, or you can contact uh, our helpline here. That, that uh, uh, email address is helpline, all one word, at csg.org. Our next speaker is Donna Cooper. She is a senior fellow at the Center for American Progress. Uh, from 2003 to 2010, she served as the Secretary of Policy and Planning for the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, where she led the design of an eight-year infrastructure improvement strategy for the state. Ms. Cooper helped craft the state's reform of its highway and transit funding system, which was predicated in part on entering into concession agreements to operate and maintain one or more of Pennsylvania's interstates. She worked with then-Governor Ed Rendell on a 12-month campaign to persuade the legislature to address the transit funding gap also. Uh, Ms. Cooper, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, and good afternoon to everybody who's on. Um, my comment today will be a little bit more focused on the state perspective than Ron's. But one of the best things about infrastructure is that 
for instance, I'm with the Center for American Progress, we would be considered a uh, left of center think tank, and the Heritage Foundation would be considered a right of center think tank, and um, 80 to 90 percent of what Ron said, I agree with. And uh, one of the benefits of that is that uh, it shows that within uh, your state and your state legislature, and even in Washington, um, in this political, uh, in these tough political times when things are very, very heated rhetorically, um, I still remain optimistic of that we can make progress on infrastructure because the differences are not deep enough to stop us. If you could go to the next slide, um, one of the the questions right now in Washington is um, whether there should be a push to reauthorize uh, Safety Lou now. As Ron uh, pointed out, he's not optimistic that will happen, that there will maybe be, in essence, another year of funding put on. What that will mean at the state level will be the exact same level of funding that you got in uh, 2010. It could mean that there's a reduction in that amount of money. It's unclear what will happen. As Ron points out, that will be known in September. Um, but there is a question about whether uh, there should be a political discussion about reauthorizing prior to the election. Many people believe that if that happens, the amount of funds that could come out of a bipartisan working group would be less than were it to happen after the election. Now, uh, this is the 2012 presidential election. It's, you know, it's unclear what will happen in the 2012 election, um, but I think that um, most of the folks in the transportation world think that uh, we could have better results post-2012. So although there's a lot of desire at the state level to push for a quicker resolution of the reauthorization of Safety Lou because of the expiration of the Recovery Act funds, um, it may not be in the state's interest at this point to uh, be pushing for uh, reauthorization prior to the election. Now that's a crystal ball calculation, but most of you know how things happen in the year before your elections uh, at the state level where it's relatively difficult to get big ideas through um, and a little bit more easily done after a big election. Next slide. So the other question that, uh, uh, in addition to those that are uh, put forward by Ron about, you know, how do we increase flexibility, uh, how do we uh, think about how funds are allocated, um, the next round of, of transportation funding may look very different than in the past because it may not have earmarks. And uh, some of you in the state legislature have probably been involved in trying to get your senator or your house member to put earmarks on the table. There's a pretty strong anti-earmark uh, perspective around Washington at this point if it sustains through 2012 then how much is in the bill and how it's allocated becomes even more important to the states because you won't be able to, um, if there is no earmark, essentially cut side deals in Washington. You'll be able to cut them in your state, but you won't be able to cut them in Washington any longer. Ron points out that there is an issue about how the funds go out. Um, there are funds, as Ron suggests, for bike trails and covered bridges. They're an extraordinarily small amount of the money that goes out. The bulk of the 35 to 40 billion that's going out for roads, highways, and bridges and transit goes out for that purpose. The question is, um, right now, there are a number of um, additive factors in the formulas that uh, drive money to where there may not be the greatest need. Um, and that's unrelated to the donor or donor donee issue. It's just that we may be sending money to states that have fewer bridges to repair than, for instance, Pennsylvania um, because of the uh, peculiarities of the formula. And those of you who are on transportation committees at your state level are probably pretty familiar with your own state transportation formulas or your own school funding formulas or your own um, uh, county aid formulas where you're able to put in particular language that would drive money um, to meet certain political objectives that may not have to do with need. And so this will obviously have to come up because if there is no increase in revenues. As Ron points out, the Highway Trust Fund will not have the level of funds that the states are used to getting over the last three or four years. So there'll be a reduction in the amount of money that will be going out. And so even focusing on need might become a bigger conversation. When there's more money to put around, it's easier to make sure that everybody's taken care of. Uh, as Ron points out, flexible pools of funds, I think, are going to be a very big part of the conversation. And I think that your states should be thinking about what that means. On one level, it's very good. You want your state to have 100% flexibility on its federal money. 
On another level, there's a downside, because now the fight of how much money your state gets that might go for buses or transit is in your state house. Uh, once it's decided by Washington, that's one fight you can avoid. It may not be the decision you want, but you're now going to be put right level, right smack in the middle of a big discussion at the state level on the proportion of federal funds that go for roads and bridges versus transit and buses. Um, there may also be a conversation about state matching requirements. Um, on average, states are matching about 50% um, uh, on transit projects, 20% on highways and roads. In the last year, it's basically been a 30% wash across the board in terms of uh, mandatory state match. Um, I'm sorry, about 25%. So you might see an increase in the federal expectation for state match. Obviously, states will have a hard time uh, coming up with additional match, um, but it might be that federal funds are going to be, if they're augmented, there might also be a desire to see the state level in, uh, investments go up as well, mostly because um, there's so much need to be addressed. Next slide. Um, there was, a, you know, some relatively uh, strong bipartisan support for the use it or lose it framework that was attached to the recovery funds. Uh, this puts your state DOTs in very complicated situations. Uh, it also does make sure that there's an accelerated process to make decisions. Um, well, I would not assume that use it or lose it would be replicated, i.e. in the recovery way, because they basically you had two years to spend money, and some of your road projects take longer than that to design but it would seem that there's likely to be, again, in these deficit days, the inability of states to sit on funds for many years. As the Virginia audit pointed out that Ron referenced, um, there are projects on the books in some of the states that are in the 10-year plans by your municipal planning organizations and funds are set aside for them, and they could be in sixth or seventh year of planning, and so that may no longer be considered acceptable. So you have to think about what that means at the, at the state level and for you in the legislative process. Um, although Ron, I could tell from his comments, does not think that uh, transit um, in, and commuter rail is the highest and best investment. There are many ways to look at those numbers, and we could talk about that endlessly. But the issues of congestion and um, dealing with them and the issues of uh, structurally deficient bridges may end up being bigger conversations and expectations with the federal funds than in the past. So that you might find at the state level that some of the road projects that are the road projects you think are most important might have to take second fiddle for a little bit of time while you take care of some of your structurally deficient bridges. Or you might find that the feds are looking for uh, increases in uh, efforts to mitigate congestion. So it's just something to think about. These are trends that might come down. You will definitely, I think, see the stimulus transparency requirements follow this money, which I think is good for, um, obviously, your citizens. It raises probably more questions for you as state legislators and state staff. But um, you know, being able to see where the money is spent and follow the money all the way to the contractor and the job, I would imagine, would follow in the new reauthorization. Um, and um, I have a feeling if uh, Secretary LaHood is still the secretary, which, you know, there's, I'm not spreading a rumor. I have no intention that he wouldn't be. But uh, this is a secretary that is very serious about safety, and uh, you may see increased um, expectations for the states to ratchet up what they're doing on the safety front. Um, in exchange for increases in federal funds. Next slide. Um, now, this is where I think the most of the work will have to come at the state level. So if you're on your transportation committee meeting, in your transportation committees, or your appropriations or rules committees, depending on where your power sits in your states, um, there's a lot of work to get done. Because whether uh, Ron a uh, point of view that we should do more roads than transit, or my point of view that we need to do more of both, or whoever. I, I don't want to put words in Ron's mouth. But the point is, we are going to have to do the work we're doing better. The Washington State Audit, the Virginia State uh, Review found that we have tremendous opportunities to do the work better, just not only by looking at how we invest better, but where we invest that we do it more expeditiously. So beginning to think with your Department of Transportation what it is you can do to uh, streamline the release of federal highway dollars and state highway dollars to projects is important. 
um, uh, some of you may be familiar with the approach that has been used in Missouri to do some uh, very accelerated bridge programs. Pennsylvania did some of those as well, bridge repair programs. Um, they require very small legislative changes, but they can really expand, uh, increase the timeline, shorten the timeline, I'm sorry, that it would take to get uh, uh, projects done. Um, you may find that you want to, whether the feds suggest it or not, given the number of structurally deficient bridges you have or congestion, you may want to use the time now for, to look at need. What are your municipal planning organizations sort of directing the funds for? And do you think that's addressing your highest and best, most important needs at the state level? Because if your money is smaller or if it's only modestly larger, you will not make much ground. And so you're going to want to make sure it goes to where it's going to have the, best, the highest and best impact. As Ron points out, I think there is strong bipartisan support for uh, expanded tolling. Uh, the secretary has come out and said that he thinks that tolling is going to have to be part of the solution. Uh, that's going to raise a lot of questions at the state level. What roads do you toll? Uh, how do you do it? How do you do it so you don't push more traffic onto untold roads? How do you make your toll roads consistent across pricing regimes? So you have a, a, a lot of homework, I think, in terms of tolling to be ready. Because if you wait until reauthorization happens to understand and look at these things and even pave the way for them, you'll have many years uh, ahead of you before you can implement the tolling regimes and reap the benefits that they could give you in terms of providing um, cash to repair your roads. Pennsylvania's work to prepare our ill-fated tolling proposal uh, was two and a half years. And it got turned down at the federal level because um, uh, the technicality, actually a pretty big technicality in our mind, but nevertheless, the point is just preparing for one tolling regime took about two and a half years and required a legislative change. And so it's important to think about that. You also are going to probably see something like an infrastructure bank or you'll see something like the federal TIFIA program expanded. TIFIA is a lending program for the states. And so thinking about what your legislative environment is and what might need to be changed to take advantage of federal loans in addition to federal grants and partnering with, partnering with private investors is another homework assignment that I think makes sense to do now because these are the kinds of opportunities that will be expanded upon in Safety Lou whenever it's reauthorized. And again, you don't want to wait till then to pass your legislation. Next slide. Um, uh, for some states, this will be a pretty big issue. You'll see some discussion about airport privatization and private partners, private public partnerships to manage your airports. Some states are going to need legislation to enable that. Um, again, this is a deeply, uh, it, it's a, a critical issue. It's a complicated issue, and it's something that, if you are concerned about your airports, you might want to start looking at now. Um, rail. Uh, most states don't have lots of legislation over their rail systems, but for those states that do, um, looking at what you might need to do to enable competitive bidding for the operation of your rail lines, to enable uh, competitive bidding for the repair of your rail lines, you may want to be thinking about those things because whether you uh, decide to take advantage of those opportunities or not, you might be forced by the federal law to look at that as an option. Uh, in terms of getting access to increased federal resources. Um, and also for those states where you have ports uh, and freight movement, um, I would imagine that there might be um, some modest expansion in federal resources on dealing with the intermodal problems having to do with moving cargo off of um, ships and onto freight rail. And uh, certainly CSX and Norfolk Southern are doing two projects that sweep up and down uh, east of the Mississippi, essentially, um, and um, they do require state partnerships. And so thinking about how your state fits into some of these very large-scale freight rail intermodal improvements might be something you want to look into so you're ready to apply for those funds if they do take the character that Ron suggested they, that uh, the overall bill might take of more competitive allocations. Next slide. Um, you will also, uh, I, I want to echo the point that I think you will see more and more competitive allocations that you might, as a state, get a, uh, you know, a, a couple uh, big chunks of federal transit grant money, and then you'll be expected to compete for the balance. 
and where you're going to obviously want to uh, see competition is where we're already seeing it, which is uh, larger rail projects, whether they're high speed or regional commuter rail or, or rail to uh, train, commuter rail to uh, uh, passenger rail connections. Um, this administration, if they win re-election, um, they are going to continue to want to deliver on high-speed rail. So you'll see um, expanded work in that regard. So it's important for you to think about how your state plays in that. Obviously, the Florida conversation shows that there's not a consensus in the states or California at this point to figure out how they want to approach this. So it's something that should be on your docket. I think you'll also see that um, because the population centers, the urban centers continue to grow, it, I'm not suggesting that there'll be a city sensitivity because it's an urbanist administration, but because our logistics companies, our shipping companies, and our employers are looking for ways to decrease congestion so they can lower their cost of moving their goods around and lower the time that their employees are spending in uh, commuting time. So there will probably, uh, if we're smart, I think, be looking at things that address congestion in um, ur large urban regions. Uh, next slide. Um, and then um, regardless of whether, and I think Ron sort of made this point clear when he said that public-private partnerships are not a panacea, um, if we can enable tolling to proceed, if we can enable an expansion of private capital in public infrastructure improvements, if we can uh, find ways to maximize the degree to which those who are the heaviest users of the system pay for it, we will still need increases in federal investment in transportation. And I know some of your states are struggling even to uh, keep up with your road and bridge repairs with the current level of federal allocations. And so um, we're still going to need to, uh, in my view, double what we're putting out there. And um, that's problematic, obviously, in these deficit times. And so I think that state legislatures, state legislators might want to think about how you help build the case for increased federal resources. Because I think if we let the game happen just in Washington, you will see status quo or less. If you want to be engaged in an effort to increase the federal resources, then I think you have to take some lead in that regard. And the next couple slides sort of talk through those options. Um, so we'll walk through those. Next slide. Um, the US Chamber is very vocal in wanting to see um, an increased level of federal uh, expenditure for the highway trust fund activities, having uh, those specifically for roads, bridges, uh, and transit, but most specifically, obviously, for roads and bridges because they're dealing with logistics issues. And they have been very aggressive in speaking for both the need for federal investment to increase and to increase the gas tax to support that. So the question is, is your chamber disseminating the US Chamber's information to its businesses so that they can also reach out to senators and House members from your state to echo that point of view? Likewise, the Teamsters and the AFL-CIO have been very vocal, uh, actually in partnership with the Chamber. I'm not quite sure that I can remember ever seeing such a uh, tight uh, partnership between the Chamber and the unions. Um, but um, it's definitely something that uh, you could augment at the state level by reaching out to the people you know in the leadership of those organizations and having them speak directly with your senators and House members in Washington. I put some data in there um, just to give you a sense of what a penny on the gas tax gets you, et cetera. Um, you may also want to look at the T for America website. Um, they recently put up a website actually last week of all the structurally deficient bridges in your state. It's tforamerica.org. And uh, you might want to begin to think about how resources about where your public assets are at risk are more um, well known to your reporters, um, to people in your House district, to people in your Senate districts if you're a House or Senate member or staffer, or to your congressional districts if you're um, somebody who just works with state legislatures. So an assets at risk list uh, can be a powerful way to get some focus on this and make it harder for people to um, justify staying within the current level of federal expenditures. Obviously. 
um, holding town meetings. We did this in Pennsylvania with many House members to talk about the fact that federal investment needed to increase um, and also to support state increases. I mean, we increased by a billion bucks what we were putting into bridges. So, um, you know, it was also a way for us to build the case for more state investment in infrastructure. Um, and next slide. This is the last one. Um, again, I talked a little bit about homework. I think it's real important to start thinking about P3 legislation. I should have written there tolling legislation. Um, these things are not mutually exclusive at all. Getting more federal investment is not going to solve your infrastructure problems. Uh, you've got to enable P3s in your state, and you've got to enable tolling, and there's terrific resources out there to help you do that, but it's a lot of hard legislative work. Oh, I see, I did put tolling. So it's very hard, and it's very controversial, but you're getting, it seems to me we're all going to have to do this at some point, so it makes sense to think about how to do it now. Um, I do, uh, as I said in the beginning, thinking with your DOT secretaries about how to um, make creative changes in your state procurement laws so that you can do more efficient bidding and more uh, streamlined bidding for your transportation projects. And already under federal law, your states have the ability to establish a state infrastructure bank. I don't know if your states are doing it. Most states are, well, maybe it's half and half these days. And that is a venue through which you could uh, leverage private, partner with private capital to do your own transportation projects. So it's something to think about putting on your docket. In closing, I would just like to say that there is, um, you know, there's another conversation in Washington about devolving the federal highway trust fund um, funds and responsibility to the states. And, and Ron alluded to that a little bit uh, in the Transportation Empowerment Act proposal, which would over time shift um, you know, three or four cents of the federal gas tax to the state level and then give you that money directly at the state level, whatever you collect. And, um, you know, I think one of the challenges that that puts you in, um, you know, the, it's always uh, you don't want to get hoisted by your own petard, but if you are in 100% of the driver's seat at the state level for uh, transportation investment, then you are not sharing the pain of, <laughs> you're not able to share the pain of gas tax increases or other revenue increases with anybody. So while you may want 100% control of the expenditures, when you um, also have 100% control of the revenue, I think it will be a harder conversation at the state to get sufficient resources. So I think the current um, uh, marriage between the federal government and the state government actually um, divide some of that pain a little bit in a way that allows us to make some progress, same as it divides the pain of making the, of, of having um, um, some um, way to have a rational conversation about uh, how we allocate across roads and bridges versus transit. So um, uh, I think that's uh, my comments and I'm happy to answer questions. Okay, well, thank you, Ms. Cooper. Uh, we're going to delve into questions now. Uh, we have uh, at least a, a few that have come in so far, and uh, if you would still like to ask one, you can uh, type your question into the window provided on the, on the GoToMeeting module that, that's on your screen there. It's the, the little uh, box marked questions, and you can uh, open that up and, and uh, type in your question, send it to us. And as it says there, if you need uh, assistance asking your questions, you can contact uh, our helpline, the helpline at csg.org, or email your question directly to us at questions at csg.org. Uh, let's uh, see what we have so far in terms of questions. Uh, this one uh, says, what were some of the ways, uh, this is for you, Doctor, uh, what were some of the ways the uh, Washington Performance Audit suggested reducing congestion? Well, they went out and did a, uh, using mostly uh, highway engineers as, as consultants, they went out and spent, um, the, the team was out there for, for three or four months and in, inspecting every road and bridge and tunnel and, and every point of congestion and then doing an analysis of each of those. And so they came up with a whole bunch of things. There were things like certain, certain parts of, of the metropolitan area. Uh, could have benefited from better timing of red lights. Uh, and, and there are other parts where <laughs> congestion on, on I-5 in certain places, which was quite serious, <laughs> was a consequence of a poorly conceived uh, uh, exit or, 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 or 
egress uh, that was designed for, for a much uh, lower level of, of, of traffic than, than occurred now. <laughs> so what it did was it pinpointed a bunch of, of, of roadblocks here and there and, and then targeted uh, the, um, uh, the spending toward those in terms of what, what, what would be the impact on, of, of, of a dollar spent on, on this project versus that project on competitive miti uh, on congestion mitigation based on the fact that we have a finite pile of dollars to work with. Now, uh, I should add that transit was not part of the issue because the watch dot does not control transit programs in, in the state of Washington, but that's rather more of a, uh, of a, of a regional uh, issues, so it didn't get into how, make, how to make transit work, uh, more efficient or, or, the, or the allocation of money from one to the other. It also recommended in, in certain places the, the implementation of hot lanes as, uh, as, as likely to bring in both more money for more, uh, more resources through, through tolling and, uh, and, and also through uh, uh, time of day pricing to, to shuffle around. Uh, tra traffic in, 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 in certain parts of town. So it was a wide variety of specific specific programs, and you could probably uh, get the full report, which is fairly comprehensive, uh, by going to the website of the state auditor. As I said, it was done in, in 2007, and, uh, and if you can't find it there, uh, you know, contact uh, Sean, and Sean can get to me, and I can give you a, a website where it's, where it's posted. I just don't have that handy right now. Uh, another question for you, Dr. Ott, uh, says, do any of the proposed reauthorization uh, plans discuss uh, movement to a VMT-based revenue approach? Uh, no. As, uh, uh, very early on in, in, the, in the administration of President Obama, uh, Secretary of Transportation Ray LaHood, uh, shortly after he was appointed uh, at a press conference, said he was sympathetic. He kind of liked the idea of VMTs and, and was looking into it. I think within 24 hours, somebody contacted, uh, he was contacted by somebody from the, Wash, from the White House saying, no, Ray, we aren't. <laughs> and he had to issue a, uh, a, uh, a correction in that. So there's been no uh, discussion of VMTs or, or gas tax increases. At, uh, at any level, either either in either in uh, either in the Congress or, or in the White House, and if you go back to the previous Congress where, where Mr. Oberstorm, uh, a Democrat, was uh, was the chairman of the Transportation uh, Committee, he came out with a very ambitious and very costly program, and again had no tax increases in it. Said so these are something we have to deal with in the future, and when he did testimony. Uh, before the Ways and Means Committee on 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 ideas for new revenues, uh, none of his ideas that he that he dis that he discussed loosely before the committee covered either a increase in the gas tax or 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 a, or a VMT charge. And I think part of that is you know with gas flirting with four dollars uh, a gallon and over four dollars a gallon with taxes in some parts of the country. I don't think any elected official wants to go there right now. Mm -hmm. Can I add one other thing? This is Donna. I also think the issue with the VMT, I'm not sure the person who asked the question um, where, where sort of where they were going, but there remains at least as I see it, and Ron, you've been around Washington much longer than I have, um, um, this um, concern about the VMT um, being able to know too much information about a person and where they're traveling. And so it, it, you know, while I think a lot of folks want to make a transfer to a VMT system, um, I have not been able to observe anybody with the political will to, to talk about it in a way that addresses the privacy issues that are associated with it. Now, I, I could be overstating what that's about, Ron, but that's my sense of one of the issues that's really holding us back. Yeah, no, no, you're exactly right on that. There is that concern, particularly since this wall, so, you know, we, you know, will be done through technology and through remote sensors, and you know, you'll have some sort of identification number, and, and so on and so on. And we know we know how many computers uh, of, of sensitive information have been hacked into. So, 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 so that is a very real risk. But you reminded me of one other issue, and that is that. So what people haven't really addressed is is the collection cost of taxes. The nice thing about the the, the federal fuel tax 
and the, and the companion state gas taxes is that they are not collected at the pump. Uh, uh, they're collected at the pump indirectly, but they're paid by the wholesalers. And so rather than uh, getting uh, collecting money from, from millions of drivers, you're collecting money from a few thousand gas wholesalers and distributors around the country. So it's a very cheap tax to collect money on. Now, if you do a VMT tax, you're now collecting from the individual motorist. And some people, some households today, it's not unusual to have two, three, five cars. And so, and each of them is is a, is a, involves a select a, a separate collection cost. So I think one thing that needs to be addressed is even with the technology that's associated uh, with, with that can be associated with the various BMT schemes, is whether uh, a, a good chunk of the revenue is, is simply going to go off into uh, into administrative costs uh, necessary to to collecting the fee. And, and whether, you know, at the end of the day, if you want to increase taxes, why don't you just increase the gas tax? So. Sort of a follow-up to that, uh, this person asked, uh, so is there any chance that uh, Washington would ever replace the gas tax with the VMT tax? And if not, should states wait around or, or, or just start pursuing <laughs> these kinds of systems on their own? Well, I don't think states should ever wait around. I mean, the whole idea is that this is a federal system, you know, and and it's it, you know the states aren't subservient to the federal governments; they're they're partners in, in in the governance of this country. And if they have a good idea and it's legal to implement, uh, then by all means they ought to do it. Um, so I wouldn't discourage anybody from coming up with their own own revenue sources uh, when when you have the the power to 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 make those changes on your own. This is Donna. Some as, I, as, I said, about, as I said, about, about two-thirds of, of surface transportation spending in, in the country uh, is, from, is at the state level. Uh, and the federal government only accounts for about a third of it. So you're also the leading source of, of, of funding for, for surface transportation programs uh, as well. This is Donna, and I would just add two things yeah. to what Ron said. There are some states who are piloting uh, VMT uh, collection models, and I would just urge um, state legislators or staff that who are on to, if you're going to pursue a VMT model, to think very carefully about how you talk about it so that you can um, deal with the privacy concerns in a way that make people feel comfortable. But I would also try to make sure that you structure your relationship with whomever your vendor is so that they are carrying the cost of this as opposed to you because eventually whatever company or set of companies figures out how to efficiently create an effective VMT system, uh, it's going to be a software-enabled system, and so they're going to make a lot of money, and I would urge states to think about how little they can be an upfront investor in that and put that on the private sector as much as possible. I would also want to clarify one thing that's confusing, perhaps, if you're not initiated in federal state money. Uh, I talked about the, fed, the states matching the federal funds about 30 percent, and Ron just pointed out that the states spend 70 percent. States spend money beyond what they match for the feds on transportation, and if that was way too elementary and you knew it, I apologize, but I knew if I was listening, I might have gotten confused between those two, two points. Uh, next question is for Dr. Ott. Uh, it says, uh, in, in uh, your presentation, you reported on the, the federal subsidy costs for various transportation modes, uh, vehicle transit, commercial airlines, et cetera. Did this analysis consider any indirect costs not passed on to consumers for the different modes, such as costs for reduced air quality, increased congestion, and travel delays, uh, accident fatalities, et cetera. A consideration of these indirect costs uh, would likely reduce the perceived benefits that single passenger vehicle travel may provide compared to transit alternatives. Um, yeah, that's, uh, you know, bringing in the social cost is, 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 is always helpful and, and appropriate, and, but how we measure those things uh, is, is equally important. Some can be measured and some cannot. I think uh, my colleague Randall O'Toole at the Cato Institute has done some excellent work on comparing um, driving 
uh, with any one of any any of the major transit systems in the United States, and, and finds that, with the exception of New York City, a Honda Prius beats them all. Uh, we also know that inner city buses uh, are far more fuel efficient than 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 passenger rail is as currently configured. <laughs> so, uh, you know, by all means, bring these things in because all this stuff is measured uh, uh, on a BTU basis, and BTUs are the most common way of measuring kind of you know, transportation impact uh, for good or ill. Uh, on, on the environment, so I, you know, I'm I'm all in favor of that, uh, and I'd like to see. And I think we're, we're re the federal government has been remarkably deficient in providing uh, timely and comprehensive uh, data on on energy efficiency by mode. And uh, with, with the, with the well, and often you have in these debates the presumption is that transit is more energy efficient. But, but uh, an empty bus, and many buses are, for the most part, <laughs> not, what, not heavily occupied, uh, uh, it is not particularly fuel efficient. Uh, and one of the reasons why Amtrak doesn't do all that well is Amtrak's load factor is, uh, is about 47% compared to you know, 80% for, for all of its competitors on both the surface and the air. Okay. But I, you know, I, I uh, welcome uh, you know a serious investigation of that, uh, uh, and that it ought to be done uh, with, with using a careful analysis of the data that we have. But, but for whatever reason, simply isn't used or isn't published, or uh, to the extent that that other information already is. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, next question uh, is for either of you. It says, could anyone comment on Virginia, which recently passed? Life cycle cost legislation. Um, I can't. <laughs> uh, this is Donna. I it, am away, only Donna. <laughs> Yeah, I'm tangentially familiar, very tangentially familiar with what Virginia did, um, but I don't. I do think. Um, Let's see, of all the things, of all the homework assignments that I put out there in terms of P3s and tolling and thinking about your safety improvements and um, looking at how money follows need in your state and streamlining your procurement, um, I, while I'm a big life cycle fan, I feel like there's so much work for legislature, legislators to do to ready themselves to move the next round of safety blue money out. I wouldn't put my time into this right now, although it is really important. And I think one of the reasons Virginia could do it, and if you're in a state that is uh, has lots of legislative flexibility on all those other options, it's really useful to do because what you're basically looking at is how your uh, the costs of your road projects or your transit projects from beginning to end. So it's it's forcing better asset management across your systems and is a useful thing to do. Um, but I know a lot of states are at more rudimentary stages of what they need to enable in their legislation to uh, do what they're doing better uh, at, a, at, a, at a more mo in a more modest scheme. And I, I, now I wish I could say people ought to do life cycle analysis in general right now, but I think people have much more tougher conversations on the on the drawing that need to be on the drawing boards and start at the state level. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, the next question we have uh, says, "What is the likelihood of a gas tax increase dependent on some future benchmark, such as an improved economy?" And are Congress and the White House simply waiting to see who blinks first regarding a gas tax increase proposal? Um, well, I can I can start off on that. There, there were um, the, the last time, maybe about four or five years ago, there was a flurry of activity in Congress to come up with different kinds of flexible gas gas taxes that where where the increase or the decrease was triggered by some event. And you know th these are interesting, and um, th but they th they never really get anywhere. You know they're introduced, uh, no, they're not considered to be serious enough or, or p potentially um, passable enough to even hold hearings and, and bring them to a vote. Uh, but, but there is a, uh, there, there has been a series of things like that. I, uh, I, I think, um, 
you know, before we can start talking about gas tax increases or, or anything related to, to, to motorist users, I think we need to sort of uh, somehow reboot the federal system and maybe even some of the state systems to give the driver and the trucker and, and the ordinary citizens confidence that the, the, the program they're being asked to provide more money to is actually going to do something that's going to benefit them. I think there's just a lot of cynicism on the part of people, and I think one of the reasons why um, uh, why reauthorization is, is not a high priority and will continue to sort of go along at a fairly low level is that nobody in Congress has, is getting any pressure from, from their constituents other than those associated with you know, lobbyists with transportation and so on, uh, uh, to do something. Uh, and, and I think you, you need to break this lack of confidence uh, in, into, into, into presenting something that seems to be meaningful and, and helpful to people that they're willing to cough up more money for. Uh, and, but it, and at the same time, I think that you know, it's cyclically, it's going to be hard to do anything like that at a time when people are paying you know four dollars a, a, a gallon for gas. You know, for for the ordinary uh, person, and and most of us are ordinary persons. Uh, this this involves a big chunk of of their discretionary income, and so I, I think we're just probably a couple years away from having a serious debate about that. Donna, did you want to weigh, on, weigh in on that uh, one? The only thing I would say is I think we, we, we did show that, um, I mean, the American people did, did sort of, um, you know, this is divided a, prop, a public at this point. But one of the things I do think the American public knows is that an, an investment in infrastructure is also an investment in the economy, and it has the potential to put a lot of people to work. So I do think that the degree to which the presidential election is about the economy and the need to have some solutions that put people to work and also deal with these you know, startlingly crumbling bridges and roads that are in terrible repair, um, I do hope that people on this call will help build the will for us to have that kind of conversation. I think Ron's right right now inside the Beltway, while there is um, a desire to talk about infrastructure, I don't feel like there's a huge public will to do anything about it. And unless the election changes that considerably, um, states are really going to be hurting. Okay. Um, this is a question we got in with uh, as, as someone registered. Um, and this person is from Texas. And he writes, uh, will federal transportation reauthor reauthorization provide more flexible options for cities and states that wish to build commuter rail systems. Mm -hmm. Currently, the one-size-fits-all requirements are not conducive to needs in the South and Southwest. Well, I'm not sure what um, the Federal Highway Program, or, the, or, or let's say the surface transportation, has to do with uh, com commuter rail issues, I mean, as it, or how it would hobble uh, them. I think commuter rail comes under uh, Federal Transportation Administration spending, and uh, and and so your your FTA allocation uh, could easily be used for computer commuter rail uh, as opposed to other transit options that that you have. Yeah, I think uh, some of this is probably derived a little bit from the problem that Los Angeles is having as well with some of its regional commuter rail and mass transit improvements. And it revolves around the interrelationship between, I might be wrong, I don't know where the Texas person was coming from, the uh, interrelationship between the FTA money and the TIFIA money in terms of creating a, a federal financing stream that could support it. And there's some serious you know, legislative language, it's very technical, not partisan, that would need to be resolved to enable those things to happen. But there, it also, I think, a little bit comes down to, I don't know if this is the case in Texas, but in other places, the MPO structure um, does not necessarily uh, comport with city and regional, tr regional uh, commuter structures. And therefore, since your plans come from the MPO, it's very difficult to get um, these innovative regional commuter plans through multiple MPOs at the same time, so they end up on the state plan and then can be submitted to the FTA. 
But I think both of those are the kinds of things that, you know, I'm not sure anybody has a partisan view about stopping, but there would have to be a practical solution that continued the integrity of the MPO system and it continued the integrity between the grants and aid program and the loan program. And I know people are working on those. I don't think they're partisan issues. I think they're technical and hard to work out issues. Um, we've got time for a, a, a few more questions and, and if anyone else has a last minute question they can uh, uh, type it into the, uh, the GoToWebinar interface here and we'll, uh, we'll pick that up. But I wanted to ask about um, the, the National Infrastructure Bank. Uh, you know, this is something that the President has talked about and uh, that uh, uh, there's been legislation introduced in Congress. Uh, I know, and it's something that, that, Donna, that you wrote about last month, this, this new bill from uh, Senator Kerry and Senator Hutchison, and I think Senator Warner was involved as well. Um, and, uh, and I know, Dr. Utt, that, that you have sort of a different view on, on the National Infrastructure Bank, but can you, uh, can you uh, uh, both of you uh, sort of address that issue? Um, should I start, Ron? No, yeah, go first. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. So look, I think that the real issue about an infrastructure bank is how do we, whether it's the Kerry Hutchinson proposal or the President's proposal or um, DeLauro's proposal, Congressman DeLauro, the issue is we're trying to find a way to lend federal money to uh, economically viable infrastructure projects so that are large scale and, er, and of um, national significance. And the idea behind that is if you can lend some pro public money, you can lower the overall project cost because you'd be basically rate low lending at the treasury rate or a little bit more. Um, in the Kerry proposal, the full credit risk of the proposal is of, of, the, of the loan is on the project. Um, so it, it operates very much like another bank, but in the case of this bank, 50% of the funds would be at a lower interest rate than might be able to be obtained in the private market for the project. I, I think they're good ideas because in general they lower the cost to the taxpayer of the project um, and they bring private capital into the project and they, um, they, they sort of blend the private expertise that's going to put discipline into a project to make sure that it's economically viable and has a revenue stream that can support it. And they bring to it the public, um, hopefully they would bring to it the public discernment of what is the real need uh, in terms of a hierarchy. Like, in, you know, if you're going to do I-5 in Washington State, maybe that, that exit is a $80 million project. I'm, I'm assuming or hoping it's not that much, but it could be. And so, um, you know, that's the kind of project, if it would significantly relieve congestion, that ought to be moved to the top of the list over other projects that might be useful but not as imperative. And so I think the private sector is not going to evaluate that so much. The public sector would. And so I think that there is a terrific marriage that's created by the infrastructure banks. Um, look, they cost money. Um, because they cost money two ways. The feds have to put up money to lend. They have to absorb the difference in the interest. They have to absorb the cost of the subsidized interest rate. Um, and at the other end, the citizens have to pay through tolls or increased state gas taxes that are dedicated or through um, some other revenue stream that's dedicated to pay back the loan. Uh, it's hard to pay for things these days. Uh, so I think it's important we're talking about this now. It's the, it's the right time to do it so that we understand it and flesh it out between now and 2012 so that we scale it and put it on the paper in the right way to launch. And Dr. Ed, what, are, what are your thoughts on the National Infrastructure Bank? Yeah, I, 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 I've looked at the, the three proposals and, and I, uh, with the exception of the, the Delaro proposal, the, the other two proposals, the, the Curry and the o, President Obama proposal are are funded um, by uh, appropriations, and the appropriation, so the money that's that's put in the bank will then be, in, in the case of the Curry Bank, be lent out. In the case of the Obama Bank, uh, lent out or used to provide grants. And um, I, I go back, and, and so in that sense, it's you know a bank is is a financial intermediary. Uh, it, it borrows money at one rate, lends it out at another, and uh, and, and survives on the spread, uh, ma making uh, viable 
loans or hopefully making viable loans um, you know for, for projects that can be paid back in some way shape or form <laughs> so in, th in this sense you, you only have sort of uh, in, the, in the Curry thing, it's only half a bank. In, in the Obama plan, it's like a quarter of a bank. And the, um, and the Delaro plan is, um, is, is now, and the, the, the legislation has changed quite a bit since, since it was first introduced, is, is probably more of a bank. But whereas the, the, you know, we're looking for viable projects, the, 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 the Delaro bank is, projects seem to have more of a social welfare emphasis to them uh, in, in terms of the, the guidelines for the bank executives to select among projects. My, my, my sense is all of this stuff can be done through the existing uh, federal highway program. I'm not sure why you couldn't sort of tweak the TIPIA program um, to um, uh, to do most of what what banks do, uh, or most of what these bank proposals do, <laughs> and and in the process save yourself creating a, a new bureaucracy. And, and if you actually read this legislation, and I've read every one of them word for word, about about three quarters of the legislation is all about building the bureaucracy, the board of directors, the chief financial officer, the chief risk officer, blah 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 blah, blah and so on and so on. So why don't we, you know, we already have 50, 58,000 people working in federal transportation. Clearly, <laughs> there's enough that can be shuffled around to do an enhanced TIFIA program, I think. I mean, that, that's one of my concerns. Um, so I, I, I would just like, I mean, I, I'm sympathetic to the idea. <laughs> the, other, the other concern I have is that, and this is, a, this is, this is why I view PPPs as, 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 as panaceas, and it's not panaceas, but, but important tools, is that I'm not sure right now that there's a whole lot of, of infrastructure projects, at least in transportation, that will provide a revenue stream that will cover the debt service. Um, you, you have uh, a, a lot of, for example, toll roads recently that started out with the highest hopes that, that have gone into big trouble. Uh, the Dulles Greenway, the, the, the South Carolina Greensville <laughs> Road, the El Camino Road, the, the Pocahontas Parkway in, uh, in, 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 in Richmond, and, and lots of others that have sort of never lived up uh, to, the, to, the, to the use that was originally projected, and therefore revenues were such that you know, they either declared bankruptcy or went into sort of a, a quasi receivership and were, were taken over. So we have to be careful about just how many um, opportunities there are out there. Uh, you know, one could argue that the interstate highway system has already grabbed uh, the good transportation linkages, and, and the ones that are left are, are kind of of secondary importance and, and not necessarily capable of, of generating the revenues necessary to, to cover their costs. And so in which case, um, you know, we're sort of back to, well, isn't this more appropriate for you know, a highway program. So anyway, that's my, those are my thoughts. And let me add just one thing, since we, we, we've been talking about PPPs, is that, and, and, and maybe your audience understands this, and, and, uh, and, and Don has spoken about them, but I think one thing that, <laughs> that we haven't emphasized is that you, you can't just sort of say, oh, well, let's do a PPP. You, a state needs to have the legislative infrastructure to actually do one. And these things are very complicated. The legislation is very complicated. And now the, you know, there's a lot of legislation that's been amended over time that, that serves as a model. But there's a whole bunch of states out there that, uh, as far as I know, don't have any PP uh, legislation. And therefore, even this valuable tool is, is not something that's an option for them because they're, they're, they, they cannot legally be uh, conducted or created uh, or, or operate in their particular state. So for, for those of you yeah. uh, who are yeah. intrigued with them, uh, I would certainly say go back and look at your statues and start talking to your legislatures and say, hey, you know, we want to be part of the future. Uh, let's go ahead and right. do this stuff. And may I build on that to one point with the folks on the phone? Those of you who are strong supporters of the Infrastructure Bank, I, at the state level, if you don't have the way to impose tolls or P3s, the creation of the Federal Infrastructure Bank will be meaningless for you. So um, it's really important that this work begin in earnest. Um, 
I will say that one of the benefits of the infrastructure bank proposals are that they would not necessarily only be limited to roads or bridges or transit. Uh, Tiffia right now is a hard time doing some transit, uh, but also in the carry and the uh, the carry proposal, it it expands to include water and energy projects. So it's a little bit more of a holistic approach to planning infrastructure, and that may not be an issue for the people on this call. They may just be transportation folks. And I do think that on some level they do represent an expansion in TIFIA, but right now our TIFIA program is very small staff. There, there may be um, like 58,000 DOT employees, but 44,000 of them work for the Federal Aviation. Uh, they work, you know, they're air traffic controllers, and TIFIA is very small staff. So states who are looking for help to put public-private partnerships together or to deal with the complications of the TIFIA program, uh, one of the benefits of a bank and one of the reasons the bills talk about a structure is because they're looking to replicate things like the European Investment Bank or the Australia Builds Program where we can really work hand-in-hand -hand with states to help them think through these really complicated new financial structures. Uh, we've gotten in a couple of uh, additional questions from folks, and so maybe we can get a couple of quick answers from from you, from both of you. Um, what are your views of the National Surface Transportation Policy and Revenue Study Commission's recommendation that current surface transportation programs be collapsed into ten programs, each uh, guided by a national plan to accomplish key goals? Uh, well, since, we, since we're giving short answers, I wrote uh, something on this, which you could find on the website, uh, I guess putting in the Heritage website, putting in keywords. Uh, I, I, whatever benefits there might be from, from program consolidation were, were more than offset by what I viewed as the, the negative value of many of their other recommendations. Anyway, short answer. Okay. And Donna, did you have any thoughts on that? I think that they, the commission did a, a, a smart job, and, and things are moving in that direction. The administration's proposal is to collapse um, down into 10 pro or not, I believe they're going from 55 to 10 programs in Federal Highway, aren't they, Ron? Um, yes, but a lot of the things is, is that they, 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 the, the program sort of lift, continue to exist at sub-programs. So, yeah, they're so, sub-programs, uh, but the, so the, yeah. Yeah. So, so it, it's it's more of a, uh, a uh, an exercise in, in in what one of my mentors described many years ago as boxology. You know, you just uh, <laughs> you have your set of boxes, and I have my set of boxes, <laughs> and so um, uh, you know, it it, 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 it it you know, and there may be administrative savings in this by by turning you know programs at one level into sub programs. But in, in no case does any of this involve extracting itself from from some sort of activity, however valuable or invaluable it may be, uh, as as part of a, a of a consolidation. Uh, right, so you I, guys might at a state level, <laughs> though. Yeah, might be an incremental way to move time. it forward. Yeah. So I have, yeah. uh, you know, so. Okay. Uh, I mean, I'd, 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 like, I'd, like, I'd like to be optimistic. I'm sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry, go, go ahead. Finish up. No, no, no. I, I, I didn't have anything important to say. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, so uh, I wanted to, to finish up on, on one question. We're, we're uh, trying to get some insider information here on all of these webinars this week. So I want to ask you both, um, uh, for, for keeping track of these issues, what are the what are the top news sites or the top blogs or, or what have you that uh, either of you uh, read on a daily basis to keep up with uh, these sorts of transportation and, and reauthorization issues? I guess first, uh, uh, Donna, if you want to start. Uh, that's interesting. You know, I, I get a set of clips every day, um, and they come from a lot of sources. Um, <laughs> Insider, I don't think there's a lot of, maybe, you know, the AASHTO website, if Jack was on, he would probably say that. The Public Transit Association's website um, is useful. Um, you know, I look at all the think tank website, but uh, mostly what, in terms of my ability to get a sense of what's going on in Congress, I'm looking at what the House Transportation Committee and what the Senate Environment and Public Works Committee are doing. Um, so I don't have any great mm, pearls of wisdom in that regard, I don't think. 
And Dr. Ud, what, what, yeah, what, what uh, I, I, it's a lot. Uh, hello? Yes. We can hear well, you. Well, oh, okay. I got a funny message uh, from from some mechanical thing. Uh, no, the um, I I use all those sources, but I also use uh, for for simple efficiency, you know, some proprietary reporting uh, sites like Bureau of National Affairs, uh, which you know covers you know provides a fairly comprehensive and fairly objective uh, presentation of you know everything that happened yesterday in in in, in, uh, in transportation or, or in, you know in the entire federal government and the entire Congress. <laughs> um, Problem is, I think you have to buy the whole package, and it's not cheap. Uh, I mean, uh, it, it, the Heritage Foundation selectively subscribes to, it, and it's about two thousand uh, dollars per year for this. Um, and there are some other proprietary uh, publications that are also very good that are almost equally expensive. Uh, and then maybe the, the cheaper version might be the National Journal. But anybody that's covering these things in detail is, is going to be costly. I mean, what I have found is is that over time, as, as newspapers kind of shrink in coverage and, and look for cost savings, that, that most of the, the – one of the first to go um, uh, is, the, uh, is the transportation writer. And so you get less and less serious transportation writing in even the mainline newspapers. I mean, even even the Wall Street Journal, for example, probably doesn't have a full-time person devoted to it. So um, that's why I am increasingly relying on these proprietary sources for just kind of keep, keeping tabs on, on, on what people are doing and, and, and how these things are progressing through Congress or through the White House. There are, there are, um, you know, there's this sort of like, you know, the gossip sort of uh, stuff too. There's a website called the Infrastructurist. There's a Streets blog. Uh, so, I mean, there's a couple, you know, folks who are sort of quoting members of the House and Senate or Ray the Hood on a regular basis on terms of what they're saying to get a sense of what's going on. Great. I'm not sure how effective or useful that is, but they're definitely out there. Well, uh, that's, a, that's about all the time we have for today's webinar. I, I want to again uh, thank uh, both of our speakers for their presentations today. Uh, I don't think we've solved all the issues uh, associated with reauthorization, but hopefully we've uh, shed a little light on the debate today. Uh, thanks also to everyone for registering for the webinar and for asking such great questions.